Hi, and welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast, where we hope to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming and food production. This is your host, Michael. Today's guest is Tom Stearns of High Mowing Seeds. Now, Tom has a long history in seed production. He started when he was young. He started with just a flyer, and he built a large seed company based on that. And that's not only a seed company, it's a certified organic seed company. So they only sell certified organic seeds. And in the episode, we go into the challenges of that, what it takes to produce organic seed. We go into some of the breeding efforts they've done some of the the cool things they're doing now in their company, such as steam treating seeds, so they get rid of the diseases actually on the seed. We talk about what it is like running a organic seed farm, because they actually produce on their farm in Vermont a fair number of varieties as well. So I've known Tom for a while and always been impressed by his knowledge of the industry, his sharing um, attitude for every all his knowledge, and just his business um, ability and how he's grown the company. And he's done a fabulous job of growing a very smartly designed company in Vermont. And it hasn't been easy. I know that they have some challenges along the way, but this is a, a great episode that kind of goes into what it takes to run an organic seed company and the state of the organic seed industry in the U.S. I hope you'll enjoy listening to this. Welcome to the podcast, Tom. Thanks. Happy to be here. So let's just give, I've already given a brief introduction of, you know, kind of what you do and high mowing seeds. What prompted you to go into the seed business? Well, I was a a beginning gardener, um, but with sort of aspirations for being connected to a bigger, bigger thing. And by that, I mean, both for myself, a bigger thing, like I growing my own food wasn't enough. I wanted to know where my seeds came from and grow, grow my seeds just as a personal thing. But then also this the bigger effort in the world toward conserving more biodiversity, uh, helping make sure that agriculture is a, a positive force in the world, not a negative force in the world, environmentally, socially, culturally. So I, I had an inkling that seeds connected me to those things early on. So I had been given some seeds by some farmers and friends and that I knew I couldn't get in any other seed catalog. So I felt this desire slash obligation to save the seeds of these things. And then I just had a lot. So the sort of entrepreneurial side kicked in mm. and can talk more about that later. But the the initial impulse was around this, um, the larger mission and what it connected me to and, and how seeds did that uniquely. Mm. Mm. And you started in your backyard. I... Worked on a farm in, in Maryland, lived on my sister's farm in Pennsylvania um, for the summer of 1995, and that's where I saved the very first seeds. And I moved to Vermont the end of that year and rented a farm in Callis. And yeah, it, there was not really, it wasn't really a farm, actually. I mean, it was just a, I just plowed up the yard there, and that's kind of how that all started. Mm. And so did you just send out, how did you get your first sales? Just to your community, or just send a newsletter out, or...? Yeah, so I made this little flyer. It's just a one-page handwritten thing. I talked to a couple of stores and um, got some initial seed racks up in some stores. And I sent this little flyer out to basically any address that I could find of someone who I thought was interested. A lot of NOFA people, like the, the Natural Farmer newspaper, which is the sort of the, the quarterly newspaper for all the NOFA chapters, published in the back of it the names and addresses of like everybody on the board of every single NOFA chapter so I and all the staff so okay. I just send I have a catalog <laughs> so really guerrilla okay. marketing totally I mean I was only 20 years old and I didn't have anything to lose and I was just sort of aggressively trying to get out in front of the people who I thought would be interested in this Okay, so now fast forward, let's say a year, two years, how did you start scaling? How did the, how, what were the early days like? Well, the early days were me growing seed and just learning the real basics of growing seed, cleaning the seed and learning that, germination tests and learning all of that. So I didn't have training. I had training in agriculture, but not seed specifically. 
So I had a lot to learn. I knew that I didn't want to put crappy seed out into the world, so I needed to learn about isolation distances so that the varieties weren't crossed with each other, um, and al already starting to learn about diseases and things like that. So those first few years were filled with a lot of learning, and that kind of has continued still, um, but a, a big learning curve early on. Mm. And managing mailing lists and, you know, bulk mailing of the catalogs and thinking about all of that. I didn't have any employees back then, but my girlfriend at the time worked side by side with me on many different parts of, of the early phase of the business. And I was in Calus for one year, then moved up to Holland for two years. And yeah, so the first couple of years were a lot of learning. And the first year, the sales were $2,000. And then the okay. next year was $8,000. And the year after that, it was $18,000. And this was when I didn't have a whole lot of expenses. So it started to be some helpful money right, right away. Yeah. So when did you know that this was a viable business and that you were in this for life? And maybe those I are two separate questions. Yeah. I realized that it was a viable business maybe on year four or five. The sales after year three being at 18,000, they jumped to 36,000 okay. in year four and then to 86,000 in year five. And that started to get to be some real money. And I started to realize that there was some serious demand, serious interest. Mm -hmm. There was not a lot of other organic seed out there. And so that's where it started to shift into being a viable business and not just a hobby. I think yeah. really those first four years, even five years, it was just me, um, some other part-time helpers. But after year five, I was like, okay, this is something for real. And that's actually when, we, when I hired my first employee and um, started thinking about it really differently. And in terms of the other question of when did I know this was something for life, it's a great question. I mean, um, I like new things all the mm -hmm. time. Figuring out new things, solving problems, um, I get bored pretty easily by managing things. And so the seed world is infinitely complex. And that's what initially attracted me to it. All the genetics, all the intellectual property, the fact that, you know, seeds and the control of seeds and genetic engineering, these are all things that are huge global issues. They're not just local issues. So mm -hmm. that attracted me and has kept me involved. So yeah, I'd say I am probably gonna stay connected to seeds for my whole life, but I got a lot of life left, so I'm sure there's other things too. Yeah, it'll keep changing as you go along because as you figure out new things, you'll pass that on to other people in your organization and then go mess with other new areas of the seed world. Yeah, yep, and um, there's new problems to solve all the time. And as we get bigger as a company, we have a whole different tier of challenges. And so that, that mm -hmm. keeps me really engaged. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the sustainable side of the organic world. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of talk around it right now. What does sustainable agriculture and more specifically a sustainable farm mean to you? Not pretending that the resources we're working with are, are unlimited mm -hmm. is a really key thing. I think we've a lot of the problems that we face in the world environmentally is based on this assumption that we'll always have enough water, we always have enough soil, and so we can abuse things, and that's just not true. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one premise. Sustainable really needs to be economically sustainable also, not just ecologically sustainable. And so people throw around the word sus sustainable in, in, and have different meanings around it. So in my mind, I want the soil that I'm farming to be better when I'm done with it, not the same. And mm -hmm. so in many ways, I don't want to just sustain the level that things are at. I want to bring more health to it. Uh, increased organic matter, for example, not decreased or maintaining organic matter. Increased biodiversity, not the same as when I started. So I think a lot about um, sort of the next step beyond just sustaining things the way they are. But yeah, one thing that I... I find being really important, like the ecological side is key and obvious in some cases, but the economic side of small to medium scale sustainable agriculture has to be there. Farmers have to make money doing this or else who's going to be inspired to come into it. And we need a lot more people engaged and involved with it. It needs to be looked at as, as lucrative 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think it totally, totally is and totally can be. Mm. So as a business owner, there are endless tasks to be done in the company. How do you make sure to focus and tackle your most vital priorities each day? One of the most important things I think for me is to make sure that I've got a team that is aligned and that is uh, better than I am at all the things that they're doing. There's a lot of things that I'm not very good at. And so getting really clear about those things and making sure that I do have the people who who instinctually love and have a skill set for those things is is really key. So they, uh, in many cases, set a lot of the priorities rather than me, and I am responding to them. If I have to tell people what to do ever, then I'm in I'm in trouble. So I find that I'm told what to do or asked for, for needing something uh, much more than I'm ever doing that to anybody else. Mm. So the roles and have shifted as the company has grown. Yeah, but it's been like this for, for more than 10 years. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's sort of philosophically been that way from the beginning. Um, I hire people that are smart, uh, set some rough parameters for them, give them the freedom to do what they need to do and ask me for whatever support and resources they need and um, expect prioritization to come from them. Mm. Um, and I, I'm there to just sort of coach and mentor a little bit on, on that sort of thing. Certainly, if somebody is overwhelmed or a situation, there's unexpected things going on, I will help with, um, with setting priorities for folks. But that doesn't happen that mm. often. Mm. So you've been in this industry for a, a long time now. Tell us about the most influential lesson you learned from one of your mentors and how has that helped you become the leader you are today? Uh, I would say some of that is, is uh, about the, the, what I was just talking about in terms of hiring and, and uh-huh. building a team and not being shy about having people smarter than you or more experienced than you in certain areas. Um, it's a joy to see somebody take a particular division of the business to a place that there's no way that I could have taken it. Mm. Um, that, that is a real joy to see. So I think the, the not being afraid to hand things off and to delegate and to give up some control is, is really key. I, I got some early advice about that. I think that was helpful. Interestingly, a lot of advice that I got early on was that I was crazy. <laughs> and I, the heck would I think that this is viable? I didn't know enough or nobody else was doing anything like this. So why would I think that I could do it? And when, it, when anybody says that kind of stuff to me, that's just even more of a reason why it makes sense to do it or to try to do it. I, I love nothing more than a wall right in front of me. So I think that being taking a longer view uh, has also been really essential. There's always ups and downs on a farm and on a business and um, keeping your eye on the direction and the goals that you have is is really key to help you not get get lost in the weeds. A lot mm-hmm. of growers that I and business owners that I know are really lost in the weeds almost all the time. And it's um, it's really hard to guide your business that way. And I know from times when I've been lost in the weeds. So I, I work hard to keep the big picture and uh, keep a you know, perspective. Mm, very good. You purchased and moved the company to a new farm recently. Tell us about the transition and where you are in that process. Yeah, sure. So four years ago, we bought a farm. And um, in that time, we've been transitioning over all the farming activities of the business to the new place. Our warehousing and offices are still where they have been for uh, 12 years. And there may be aspects of that that we transition over to the new property eventually too. But the the main point of that site was for the farm. And it's been it's been wonderful. I mean, we, we had a three-year search process for an ideal site, an ideal farm. And being seed growers and our research trials and breeding it's a pretty unique kind of situation we were looking for in a farm. So yeah, it's been also a little bit luxurious to have a few years to plan that transition. We didn't just buy it and immediately start farming, and, you know, move everything over there. It was about actually four, took four years to transition everything over there. Year one was just cover cropping a bunch of things. Year two, we moved some seed production there, but nothing else. Year three, we moved all the seed production there, but nothing else. And then this summer was year four, and we had seed production, research trials, and breeding 
all there. So it's really the first year that all that's been there. Mm. And having that all consolidated must make everything a lot easier. It, it does, but it's also a bit of a pain because we need these isolated fields from each other. So consolidated is a, is a luxury that the, as a seed grower, I can't really mm. um, always afford. So yes, it was more consolidated than it was before, but we also got rid of a number of isolated fields and shrunk from six isolated fields down to three isolated fields. And so there are definitely some limitations of that too. Gotcha. So did you maintain any other properties or you said, we're just going to have to realize that this is where we are and we're going to deal with it as that is? Yeah, we did. We let go of a number of other fields that we had that we've been renting for years, partly because if I felt like we weren't doing as good a job on the farm as we could. Mm. And we were spread a little bit too thin across all those different fields. Anybody who's farmed distant fields from their home farm knows the logistical headaches around some of that. You know, you can mobilize all your equipment miles down the road and realize you forgot one tool that you needed, or some fields might have irrigation and some might not, or some might have electricity or be more accessible or less accessible, all that stuff. And so by shrinking from six down to three, while we did let go of some flexibility for crop production, we enhanced a lot of other aspects of things. And I think that we can expand again and add a fourth isolation and a fifth and a sixth once we kind of regroup and get our systems in better place. So Mm. we're looking at that for this coming year of adding another field. But now I'm spoiled with our farm because it's pretty nice. So I don't want to just lease some other crappy field somewhere. I want to find uh, additional really good fields. And so we kind of bought the really good one. And so it's a little bit of a step back in some ways to be like, okay, I got to find this, you know, isolated spot that's now it's full of rocks and a little bit wet as opposed to the home farm, which has no stones and is sandy and flat and dry. So mm. yeah, figure things out like that. So in setting up this new farm, I, I, you put a lot of thought into it. What are some of the particular aspects that makes it a lot easier to farm on it? Obviously, the soil is great. I remember that, talking to you about that when you started looking for it. But what other things yeah. have you done? Well, like I said, it's flat, it's stone-free, it's sandy, it's well-drained, it's open. There's great sun, great airflow, and there's like seven times more acres than we currently need. So we have a a lot of potential there in that scenario. One of the things that I think was a challenge for us in the past is we had all these multiple fields. The beds were multiple lengths in this field or that field. That meant the row cover was multiple lengths or irrigation or planning or tracking things was hard. And so we really built a a system there on the farm, a uniform block design. Mm. where all the fields are exactly the same size and I have 34 of them that are exactly the same dimension. And it helps with rotation. It helps with all of the tracking that we do. And we do a lot of tracking. Okay. The hours to do this task, how many tons of compost we put down on this block, what's our yields. We're doing a lot of research around all that. And um, being able to have this very uniform blocks was really essential. And Other folks on my farm team thought I was a little crazy about it, but after the first season, they all confirmed that they loved it, Mm. and uh, we tweaked a few things a little bit, but we're all really settled on it and feeling really good about it. So that, I would say, has really, really been huge and been pretty key. Mm. No, that's key. Having those uniform sizes just make everything so much easier. So let's talk about the organic seed industry. Where are we in that process? Um, What is, what would you say the state of the organic seed industry at this point? I would say it's, it's not quite in its infancy. It's just a little bit older than that, but it's still pretty small. Okay. Um, There are not a lot of seed companies out there selling organic seed. There's not a lot of people breeding varieties specifically for organics, but it's more than it was five years ago and certainly more than it was 10 years ago. What you have is uh, a lot of companies that are European-based have really are, are really ahead of the U.S. Europe has had a, a larger organic community, and the rules around organic farming and the use of organic seed are stricter in Europe. And so that has enabled 
more investment and more growth of the organic seed industry in breeding focused for organics. We partner with pretty much all of those European seed producers and seed breeders to bring those varieties here, as well as doing our own production and breeding and working with plenty of people in the U.S. for both of those things. So the team has grown and expanded, and there are more professional players in it. I mean, 20 years ago, when we were just getting going, I was trying to convince any farmer I knew to start trying to do organic seed. It's just really tricky. There's very unique climactic considerations, and it's trickier than vegetable production, long, much longer season, way more diseases and insects that come into play, specialized equipment for harvesting, all that stuff. So to have some professional outfits involved with it now is definitely helpful. So as it's scaled up a little bit and more people are buying organic seed, the economies of that make sense for people to get involved who maybe are bigger scale operations and they just wouldn't really touch it otherwise. So it's okay, it's good, but we, we need more people engaged with it for sure. Yeah. To that point, is there room for more growers of organic seed around the U.S. on small scale? It definitely. It depends on what small scale means. And what we need is more good growers, more growers who are really reliable. And like I said, seed production is tricky. It does not fit well with vegetable production, in my opinion. Most of our growers are strictly seed producers. And again, there's, there's specialized knowledge and equipment and things like that that come into play. And that's not meant to discourage anybody from getting into it, just to recognize that it's not the same as growing vegetables. Mm. And it has some, some totally different elements to it. And what we need are more medium scale growers. At least this is what high mowing needs. It's more yeah. medium scale growers. And there's a lot of other seed companies out there that, that people can sell their organic seed to, especially when they're just getting started and growing small amounts or just trying to figure things out. We tend not to be that company. Um, we tend to be a place that has bigger contracts and working with people who already have a little bit more experience. Interesting. So you also grow a portion of your, the seed you sell. Tell us some of those unique challenges, especially because you're in northern Vermont, which has its own unique weather challenges. Yeah, it is a tricky place to, to grow seed because it's such a long season crop. Um, we have a short season here. The other ch main challenge besides the length of the season is the severe cold in the winter that makes overwintering certain biennial crops nearly impossible. Mm. Um, and even with a lot of protection, even in unheated hoop houses, there's plenty that won't make it. And then the other major challenge is around the moisture. This is a pretty moist climate. Even if it's not raining, there's heavy dew every single morning. Um, or there's fog in the valleys that hangs in there for, you know, from like midnight until 8 or 9 a.m., let alone the fact that it can rain at any point. So there are disease-related issues that come into that dampness, um, but then there's also just the physical aspects of trying to dry down seed crops in the field when it's raining all the time or it's dew on everything all the time. So, yeah, it is tricky. It is not a very good place to grow seed. So there are limited crops that we produce here on the farm, and then we find growers in other climates for other things. Yeah, I ended up speaking to one of your growers out in Montana, which is a completely different uh, environment. Yes, and most of our seed growers are out west in fertile valleys of the west that are arid during the summer. So mm -hmm. most of the west, anyone who's lived out there or been out there probably knows this, but California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, all those places, they generally don't get any rain from May through September. There are some monsoons that come in the southwest in July, but in, in the more northern part of the west, there really isn't much rain that happens for that, you know, four, five, even six month period of time. Um, and that's really essential for, for a lot of seed production and disease related issues. So we have a lot of growers in those places. Mm. So let's talk a little bit more about now the quality of the seed available out there. Is it the same across all companies? You know, are there variations? Are there different sizes of seed that growers can get their hands on? Yeah, so I mean, just like with a vegetable grower or any farmer, some seed companies focus on uh, on high quality. Some focus on I don't think focus on low quality is really a thing, but have lower standards. Maybe the customers that they're selling the seed to 
also have different standards. A lot of times in the seed industry, it's assumed that home gardeners don't need as high quality seed as commercial growers. It may be because the by quality, I mean things like the germination rate of the seed, the vigor of the seed, the trueness to type of the seed, the disease-free uh, nature of the seeds, um, the uniformity of the size of the seed, the cleanliness of the seeds. Those are all quality traits that we look at. Because we sell mostly to farmers, that's something that our customers absolutely demand of us. So we tend to have pretty high standards for seed quality, and it's sometimes very hard for us to find the quality of seed that we need, and that's why more growers, good growers, more people engaged in it would, would be helpful. So yeah, there's a lot of different aspects of quality that we focus on. It's a pretty big part of the business. Yeah, I remember, I forget, a couple of years ago we spoke, and you were talking about how the best of the best seed is always saved by the seed growers to replant and then there's a varying levels of different size growers end up getting the different level qualities after that. Yeah, I mean, ac across the seed industry, let's say you have a big acre, a, a big field of, of carrots for seed. When you're cleaning that seed, you might have some of that seed that goes to farmers, some of it that, that goes to home gardeners, you know, a bunch of different things. We don't do that here. We have one level of quality and that goes to everybody, but it's driven by the commercial grower and the quality needs that they have, the, the really exceptional quality mm -hmm. that they have. So our home gardeners and our small seed packets that are in hardware stores and garden centers and things like that, that's all the same quality. It might be different varieties, but it yeah. needs to hit the same quality targets. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I know is that you're always innovating in the industry. Um, tell us about some of your recent innovations and what do those mean for growers? So there's, a, there's a few different things there. One I'll talk about is how we find new varieties and our product development process. We have a team here within high mowing that sort of has representatives from each of the different parts of high mowing. It might be seed production. It might be breeding and trials, uh, sales inventory management and purchasing, all these components that are looking at where the varieties come from. And we have a really distributed approach. We don't do breeding of all these different species here on our farm, but we work with breeders all over the world that we align with for the quality that they're looking for in their varieties, the organic breeding programs that they're investing in, things like that. So we partner with folks all over, license varieties, that we find are working exceptionally well uh, in our organic trials. And then we arrange seed production through our own network of growers or on our farm to bring those varieties out to people. And then some of the sales of those varieties goes back to support that breeder and that breeding relationship. So we do that with dozens of breeders, tiny, tiny little amateur single shop breeders all the way up to very large multinational companies that we find varieties that work really well and we want to bring them into the organic seed form. So that's something, I mean, we've got varieties that a lot of folks don't have because of that approach and we think that that's really important. The other thing has to do with disease on seed. There's very little testing that's done in the current state that the organic seed industry is in around diseases. It's pretty standard for most conventional seed to be tested and then treated for a lot of diseases. Again, because the organic seed industry is so young and a lot of it is still focused on home gardeners, there's not so much the requirement for that disease testing. But here we do a lot of disease testing across all sorts of different crops. Organic growers have less tools to control those diseases, less seed treatments that are approved for organics, less sprays that are approved for organics, or the desire to spray less, so many different pieces. So we're doing a lot of research on what ways we can combat those seed-borne diseases, and then minor diseases that might be on the seed a little bit, but they're also in your soil or they're blowing in. But the presence on the seed might just be enough to, to make a difference, and so we want to clean that up. So mostly that's around heat treatment of seed where we can kill the disease through heat without killing the seed. Hot water treatment is something that many growers know about that's been done for a long time. It's relatively imprecise and has some damaging effects, but we're using aerated steam 
and having pretty incredible results. So that's a fun part of quality control research that I get to head up. Cool. So then basically a seed lot might come in that has some disease on it and you can steam that and uh, eliminate that. Yep. And, you know, it, it affects different lots differently. So let's say the seed lot germinates at 80%. Yep. It's a little bit low or it's a little bit old or whatever. The treatment is always going to have more of a negative effect on a, a weaker seed lot like that. But if it germinates at 98%, but it still has some disease issue, then the treatment doesn't you know, impact the germination rate nearly as much. There's a lot of diseases out there that there aren't even chemical treatments for. I mean, there's a bunch of basal-related diseases that we've been killing with steam treatment that we've been doing for conventional growers. So we're, I'm actually treating conventional seed with this treatment for other seed companies because even they don't have any tools. Very interesting. And uh, this, this technology, is, is this European technology? No, this is our own stuff. We've been doing years of research on this, and I've learned from some of my friends in Europe some related things, yep. but we've done research in-house. Okay, so it's your own process now. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. So in the organic world, what new forces are changing the market? And are you adapting your strategy at all because of them? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we're always paying attention to the organic regulations because that does have an impact on on seed. Mm -hmm. um, as, as probably many of your listeners know, and as you know, uh, organic growers are, are required to use organic seed if they can find the variety that's available that they're looking for. And that is taken more strictly by some certifiers than other certifiers. And so responding to that and responding to some of the changes that might be coming um, to make that a little bit more stricter is something we pay attention to. The varieties and the trends that there are out there for certain types of crops is important. So looking at our customers, you know, we have some customers that are really innovators themselves and others that just are going along doing the same thing they've done for a while and trying to get better, but not necessarily looking for the next cutting edge type of crop or new variety um, or new market. So we're paying attention to all those sources of information to try to see, okay, is edamame going to be crazy hot in the next few years? Or is it endive now? Or, you know, is there some type of lettuce that is just going to go nuts? So trying to respond to those things, we tend to be a little bit trend averse. Like we're, we aren't chasing the next new hot thing that a chef thinks is really cool. And there certainly are RC companies that do that. Yeah, we pay attention to, to those kinds of things. Mm, I know like multi-leaf lettuce is something that's really hot right now. And I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. I have seen you guys start adding more varieties around that. Yeah, I mean, the first wave of varieties that came out were not available as organic seed. So organic farmers could buy them from conventionally from other seed companies, but it took a while for us to work with our breeding partners to get some of those varieties and that type available as organic seed too. So sometimes it takes a little bit longer in that yeah, way. Yeah. All right. Um, let's sort of do a couple of wrap up questions. Um, imagine you're standing in front of future farmers. What are two or three strategies you would recommend they focus on to ensure success? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I get teased by my crew for this, but I really believe in farming on paper first. Okay. Um, like planning is essential. Planning for every contingency. What's going to happen to this crop if it rains? What's going to happen if I'm at the farmer's market and it rains every freaking Saturday? I produce beautiful crop, but no one's there to buy it. You know, whatever it is, thinking about your rotation you can plan and figure that stuff out in the winter time so that long before you've put the first seed in the ground or the greenhouse, you have a sense of how to respond to different scenarios as they come up. Part of the reason why I think that's important is that most vegetable growers have one chance a year to do this. That yeah. means that, you know, I've got like 40 more seasons before I'm going to be too old to be messing around with this stuff anymore. 40 more seasons to figure out how to do it better. That's not very many. If you're yeah. a baker, you can have a chance every day 
to improve your loaf of bread and how you do it, how long you proof it for, what your ingredients are, what temperature you bake it at, all that stuff. You could do that once a day. Heck, you could probably do it three or four times a day. So your cycle time is so much shorter. So planning and thinking through and certainly visiting other farms in the growing season are key ways to speed up your own cycle time so that you can learn and play and practice so that you uh, yeah, make progress quicker. Yeah, so you're more successful faster. Yep. And the other thing I would mention is about the economics, like I talked about before, like know your costs. You don't need to have a degree in accounting, but know your costs, know your revenue, drop things. They're not making you money or figure out how to you know, do it differently so you can make money. Don't just grow leaks because you love leaks. Make sure you can afford to grow things that lose you money before you start growing them or before you continue them. Mm, mm. That is, that's great advice. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Excel. Okay. <laughs> that's awesome. Totally is Excel. Yes, because again, it comes back to that planning aspect. Totally. Planning, tracking, all kinds of things. I mean, I'm keeping track of so many details during the growing season with my team, and we're making things better in real time because we have access to data. And without that access to data, you are only going on your gut and on your impressions or on falling back to the ruts of how you've always done it or how you were taught to do it when you first learned about this instead of the, the, the truth. So um, I think it's, that's pretty essential. And I think what you said there was key is Excel and tracking equals truth. Yep. Yeah, right there. And you don't want to track everything. I mean... Part of the thing is figuring out what numbers matter. You know, if you look at your labor, your payroll, if that's one of your biggest expenses, then focus on that. You know, if the compost you buy each year is 1% of your expenses, then, you know, if you make a huge improvement on how much you use it, it's barely going to save you any money. So focus on the things, you know, the biggest fish first, and then you can get down to the things that are smaller. But, you know, it's pretty easy to address some of those expensive, you know, big expenses you have and start saving some real money really fast if you're paying attention to it. Mm, that's good. Do you believe that now is the best time that we starting a farm? And if so, why? Oh, I think it is a good time. I mean, many growers that I, many young farmers or new farmers that I know really struggle with some issues around land access and things like that. I think that the market in most cases is pretty good still. You can't just start another CSA in an area that has 10 CSAs, for example. Like You've got to think differently about it because there is some saturation in certain parts of the market. I know some growers would think about institutions and selling to hospitals, places like that more as a little less capped of a market. Some minimal processing is a way to help attract a new type of customer. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of doing it, but I do think it is a really good time to get into it. I mean, I know growers who are making, you know, a hundred grand an acre at gross and are netting at least, you know, 20, 30, 40 grand an acre on a couple acres. Like this is not impossible to do. And so the land access thing never felt like that hard for us. I mean, maybe we're in Northern Vermont, but we can buy pretty nice farmland up here for four grand an acre. And if you're netting 10 grand in one season, then it's not an issue of paying it off. It's just an issue of getting the money up front to buy it. Mm. So I think it's, um, it's a great time to start. I think thinking about what scale you want to start at will really help determine, you know, the accessibility to some of the things you need to get started. So maybe start small or start medium, um, but not huge. And uh, it can be helpful. Mm. Tom, any final thoughts you have for our audience? No, I would just say um, thanks for all the support that people have given us for so many years. I mean, any business grows because its customers buy stuff from it, right? That's how a business grows. So if the stuff they're buying doesn't work, then that business is likely not to grow. And so it's our customers who have been deciding how big we are. And we're very enthusiastic about continued serving of our customers and farmers out there. Um, so people should, you know, should keep in touch and let us know what they need. Tom, thank you so much for being on the podcast. All right. Take care. Thank you. 
there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.